Amen. And good evening, church. Good to see each and every one of you here tonight for our last evening of this series. It was good being here with you all. And tomorrow morning, we will conclude uh, this entire series um, with our last message. But tonight is a very crucial topic. And tonight's topic is entitled The Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast. Before we get into the subject, why don't we bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we ask, Lord God, for your blessing. We ask, Lord God, for your clarity. We pray, Lord God, that you're given the strength to speak. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to call your attention to Revelation 9, uh, chapter 14, ver beginning at verse uh, 9. And we're going to look at something very crucial in the scriptures. Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 9. If you have in your Bibles, that'd be great, but I have it also on the screen. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or, or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Tomorrow morning, we will look more deeply in the topic. What does God mean when he says the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever. Don't miss that tomorrow morning. Comma, or semicolon, look what it says. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives his mark, the mark of his name. And right there in Revelation 14, we have perhaps one of the most fearful uh, uh, condemnations or, or threats in the entire scriptures. Now we know God is a loving God and God would never utter strong words like these if it did not merit these words. God pictures in the Bible an angel symbolically who is going across the world seeking to warn the world telling them listen do not worship the beast. For if you worship the beast, there are dire consequences to worshiping the beast. And so the question tonight is, what does it mean to worship the beast? For I do not want to, I do not want to receive the mark of his name. I do not want to worship him and I want to avoid um, having to deal with this consequence. In entering the subject of the mark of the beast, I remember being a young teenager, and, and I began to get excited about, uh, about uh, theological subjects and, 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 and issues about God and, and the Bible. And I remember at times that I would leave my high school. I was, in, I was living in Brooklyn at the time. I was going to high school in Queens. And so I would leave my high school and come home. And sometimes I wouldn't even do my homework because I wanted to research what would be happening and, and last day events. And these things engrossed my mind. But I remember being a young teen, and the subject of the mark of the beast was running through my mind. And I remember reading online that there were people who actually thought that the mark of the beast was the barcode. Yes, that's right. In fact, if you look at the barcode closely, in the beginning of the barcode, if you notice, there's two uh, thin lines, and in the middle of the two thin lines is a space. Do you see that between the five and the zero? And then that same type of barcode is in the middle. And, in the la and at the end of it is also the same type of code. Well, you will find this on most barcodes. And as I looked online, I learned 
that that thin line space and the thin line that you can see in the beginning in the middle and at the end is actually the code for six and so what they're saying is that in the beginning of every barcode even if you don't see the number under it the code for six is in the beginning the code for six is in the middle and the code for six is also at the end so people say listen the 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 anything that has a barcode i'm not gonna buy anymore and friends i'm pretty sure if they thought that way they wouldn't be alive anymore friends this is not this is not the mark of the beast friends or other people perhaps they thought that if they were if they had maybe a a, a credit card and when they had a, a chip inside maybe this was the mark of the beast because you know in the bible it says if you do not have the mark you cannot buy or sell you can see that in revelation chapter 13. But there was another development when I was younger that I, that I saw that was really, really to me, kind of, kind of seemed like it could per perhaps be the mark of the beast. This was called the Verichip, and it has different names. The idea is that they came out with a chip that's the size of a grain of rice that could be implanted into the hand. In fact, you could look online, there are some animals that actually have this chip implanted into the body so they will have to, so they can keep track of the, the of the uh, of the of, of their pets. Not only that, some people, in fact, I know of at least one person from what I read, actually has this chip implanted into his body. And the idea from what I read in the past is that they can use the chip in case of an emergency, perhaps the person cannot speak anymore. All they will have to do now in the hospital, as opposed to looking for an insurance card or looking for the records of the person, they could, see, they could just scan the chip and they could see the blood type, they could see the medical history, and etc. Also, I've heard that with this chip, there's also a, 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 a function where it can actually be used as currency or it can carry currency. So you can go to the store and pr purchase goods without actually using paper money. Friends, this is old from what I read. And, and, and a long time ago, I remember reading these things. And to me, I'm wondering, perhaps back then, could this be the mark of the beast? And maybe if you were to join in the conversation, you would tell me that maybe you know some people who think that a tattoo is the mark of the beast, etc. But perhaps a physical mark that you can see with your eyes. Perhaps Satan is very happy if we think that's the mark of the beast. Perhaps he's happy if we think a physical mark is the mark of the beast because maybe that's the furthest thing away from the truth. If we want to study what the mark of the beast is, we have to take very close insight into what the Bible says the mark of the beast is. Before we do that, I want us to look at Revelation chapter 13. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. And I want to read a few passages, a few verses from the New American Standard Bible. I'll be alternating between that and the New King James uh, today. Revelation 13, when you have it, please say amen. And we're going to just read a few verses out of Revelation chapter 13. And I'm going to begin at verse 15. Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to begin at verse 15. Look what it says. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the, of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand, on their right hand, or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except or to sell except the one who has the mark either the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom verse 18 let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number is that of a man and his number is 666 and so the Bible presents that there's going to come a point in time, and it hasn't come yet, of course, 
where there's going to be a a uh, 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 a force that will impose people to take the mark of the beast. Now, if they do not take the mark of the beast, there's going to be the consequence that they cannot buy or sell. Now, this mark of the beast, it could be anything if we think about it. But if we really want to study very deeply what the mark of the beast is, it becomes wise to first identify who the beast is. If you want to know who the mark of the beast is, then we need to identify in Revelation 13 who this beast is. This beast is described in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. And let's go there, just in the same chapter. Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. If we want to know who, what the mark of the beast is, let's first identify who the beast is himself. Verse 1, look what it says. And the dragons stood... On the sand of the seashore, then I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Watch this. He was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like those of a like mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Let's keep reading. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave testimony. He gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe, people, and tongue, and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone, that is, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life, of, in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. We'll stop there for now. So, wow. This beast is a massive power that God in his love wants us to study and wants us to know exactly who it is. Now, if you were here yesterday, you would hear something that sounds a little familiar. You heard that the beast has attributes of a leopard, but it also has an attribute of a lion, but also has attributes of a bear. Does that sound familiar to you, to you friends? What does that get back to you? Anyone in the Bible? Let me know. Daniel chapter 7, right? Yes, in Daniel 7. By the way, this is the beast here in Revelation 13. In Daniel 7... We had uh, the, the four beasts, and the beasts represent what? Kingdoms. Today, we have a, a many nations who adopt various animals to represent them. Even the United States has a national bird, the, the eagle, and et cetera, et cetera. You can even fill in your own country. Most likely, they may have an a, a animal or actually multiple animals that represent them. But in Daniel 7 yesterday, we saw that these beasts were symbolic of kingdoms. We saw for the first part that the first beast was Babylon that was symbolized as a lion with eagle's wings. And then we saw that the kingdom that came after Babylon was Medo-Persia with a bear that was leaning on one side with three ribs in his mouth. The, uh, the next one. And then we saw after that that there was Greece Greece was that leopard-like creature with four wings and four heads. And we saw a, a little deep, deeper uh, the significance of these kingdoms. And then we saw a fourth dreadful beast. And on top of the, the, the head of that fourth dreadful beast was a little horn that spoke blasphemies. And it spoke, and it, it even tried to make war with the saints and et cetera, et cetera. But friends... As I study Revelation 13, I realize 
that this first beast that arises out of the sea has attributes of Babylon, which was the lion, has attributes of Medo Persia, which is the bear, and has attributes also of, of um, Greece, which is the leopard. This tells me that this beast has something in common with those three kingdoms. We saw, in fact, we see now that in those kingdoms in the book of Daniel, Satan was employing them to persecute and make war against God's people. But the same thing again is happening in Revelation chapter 13. But as I read it, friends, and let, let's, I want to do a quick uh, uh, snapshot of what I see in chapter 13. Look at the attributes again. It receives power and authority from the dragon. And we're going to see who the dragon is. Um, it receives a mortal wound, but it's healed. It has worldwide, power, uh, worldwide fame, and it's, it has a huge religious influence. All of the world marveled and followed it. It has blasphemy power that even speaks, tries to even speak um, against or even for God. And it persecutes God's people. Friends, we won't spend much time on this, but yesterday we saw, if you look at this closely, this beast power has a striking resemblance to this little horn power in chapter 7. And yesterday, friends, we went to the center of the subject and we saw that this little horn, i.e., or a.k.a., the Antichrist of the Bible, is none other than who? Friends, don't be afraid to say it, friends. The Roman Catholic Papacy. And friends, yesterday I read you quotes from historic Protestant reformers living hundreds of years ago, some, some of you even 500 years ago, such as Martin Luther, uh, uh, John Calvin, uh, uh, John Wesley, people who are historic people who are, who are looked upon highly by Protestants of many denominations today, who all testify and say that the Roman Catholic papacy fits the biblical description of what the Bible says the Antichrist would do. We saw last uh, uh, yesterday that the horn, which is the Antichrist, arose from the power that was identified as Rome. And so we saw yesterday that the power must come from Rome. We saw that this power would actually intend to change times and laws. And we know that the Catholic Church has seen itself as having the ability to transfer God's holy seven-day Sabbath unto Sunday. They would not shy away from that. And, and I would encourage you, friends, I would encourage you, whenever you hear things like this, not to shrug it off, but I would encourage you to go ahead, be diligent for your own life, for your own family, studies at home, and confirm whether what I'm saying is true. Confirm it. You owe this to yourself and owe this to your families. You, you see what I'm saying? And so we saw that they on the project say that, yes, we took it from Saturday and we did it to Sunday because we have the authority to do so. And in the past days, we saw that because that seven-day Sabbath begins on Friday night, it's concluded on Saturday night because we saw in creation that a biblical day begins in the evening. The evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. And so Genesis 1 makes it very plain. Genesis 1, let's go there. I don't want to, in case you weren't here, I don't want to rush by this uh, so this won't sound too far to you. Genesis 1, we're going to begin at verse 5 and then look at verse 8. I think that will be enough to prove the point. Um, verse 5, look what it says. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Verse 8, God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning a second day. This is the New uh, American Standard Bible. And so we saw very clearly that God's Sabbath begins in the evening because the day begins in the evening. So from Friday night, sunset, God's Sabbath starts. And we saw that even before there was a single Jew, 
even before there were different ethnicities, before, before the Chinese came in the scenes and the Jamaicans came in the scenes and, and, and the, the Europeans came in the scenes, before there were any, any type of different cultures, even with Adam and Eve, the Bible says, on the seventh day, God rested. Therefore, meaning that the Sabbath day has nothing to do with the Jews. It preceded them. Rather, the Sabbath day we saw in Exodus chapter 20 points to the creative ability of God that God created the world. God created you and me and breathed into us the breath of life. And this, friends, becomes the foundation of why we worship God. Because God deserves to be worshipped because if he did not create us, we would not exist. We owe our existence to God. And on the seventh day, we acknowledge, oh God, because of you we exist. I have eyes because you formed it. I have a mouth because you created it. I have a body because you fashioned it with your own fingers. Continually. God saw that even Adam, before sin, needed this reminder that he should not forget. Study Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. The longest commandment and the only commandment that God begins with the word remember is for some reason the only commandment that many have either accidentally or purposely chosen to forget. The longest one. And so we saw that God sanctified, friends, a particular day. I cannot choose what day I want to rest. That's not how it works. God sanctified a particular day. We saw in the New Testament that even when Christ came, that Christ did not abolish the, the law. In fact, he even says, do not even think I came to abolish the law. In fact, before we go further, I want to review this with you. Um, and I'm going to read a verse that I did not read. Matthew chapter uh, 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read this for you. Very, it's very important. Matthew chapter 5. So we will leave on the right foundation. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to begin at verse 17. Matthew 5. We're going to begin at verse 17, okay? And, I, and it would be good if we all have this. Matthew 5, beginning of verse 17. Watch this. Look what God says. Christ says. We know the Sabbath was in the Old Testament. Look what it says. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven. Look how graphic Jesus is getting. Until heaven and earth pass away. Not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then he says, verse 19, whoever then annuls, that is whoever tries to do away, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So what that's saying is that the kingdom of heaven shall consider this person least. It doesn't mean that if you teach people not to keep the commandments that you be in the kingdom but you just be the, the least one that's what they're saying no rather the kingdom of heaven will regard a person such as this a person who would teach to disregard even the least of god's commandments as the least let's keep going in verse uh, 19 the second half shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever keeps and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven so we want to set the stage so far that it is not safe to trifle with even one of God's commands. For as James chapter 2 verse 10 says, if you stumble in one, you are guilty of all. If you break one, you have shattered the whole thing. Obedience to God is not, is not optional. And in case, I want to stop here. In case we leave here with a doubt that the Sabbath is on the seventh day, on, on from Friday night to Saturday night. If you still have doubts, before you leave, make sure you talk to me. Ask me any questions. Because you cannot afford to leave here 
without that conviction that this is the true day of worship. We worship God any, every day, but there's only one day that's sanctified by God. Okay. So that foundation, we thought that very clearly that the papacy has sought, or the Roman Catholic Church has sought to replace God's day with their day. In fact, look at this quote right here. This source, we're going to look at it again. Uh, this is a, um, from the Converse Catechism of the Catholic Doctrine. Um, if you were Catholic, you'll probably receive this as a new convert. And look what it says. Look what they're saying. Which is the Sabbath day? The answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do you observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Does that make sense? And so I'm trying to show you clearly. And remember yesterday we stopped and we saw that none of this is calculated to be an attack against a Catholic person, against a member of a Catholic church, because I have personally interacted with many of them, and there are great people, many of them. Many of them have no idea that this was the case, and it holds the same for Protestants. However, when you analyze it as a system, this, the system itself is anti-biblical, and this is the issue. All right. With that background, we can see more clearly how we can see that this beast that arises from the sea very convincingly is the Roman Catholic papacy. As we can see, that it, has, it, has, uh, uh, it tries to exalt itself above God's law. Um, let's look at the first one, the first uh, bullet point. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible says that this beast received its power and authority from the dragon. And so the sea beast who we're seeing today is the same power as the little horn of Daniel 7. The Bible says in chapter 13 that it receives its power and authority from the dragon. Now, here's the question. Who's the dragon, friends? Okay, well, that's, that's correct. Because I will look what it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. It says... He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old. Yes, that same person in the Garden of Eden, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And so we're not guessing. The Bible clearly tells us that the, the dragon is Satan, the serpent of old. However, I want us to go to Revelation chapter 12, the previous chapter. Let's go to that chapter and we're going to see something very interesting. Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to begin at verse 1. Chapter 12, beginning of, have you please say amen. All right. Begin verse 1. Look what it says. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and she cried out being in labor pain and in pain to give birth. We're going to go down to um, verse 5, same chapter. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nation with the iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her by God. And so is this one. In chapter 12, the Bible shows us there's a woman. And this woman was pregnant. And the Bible says she had labor pains. She was with child. They had labor pains. And as she was pregnant, the dragon stood before her. And the dragon wanted to do one thing. He wanted to devour that child that was going to be born through that woman. But the Bible teaches, as opposed to the dragon devouring that child, and we know the dragon is Satan, the child was caught up to God and to his throne. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think in biblical history is the child that was born that Satan wanted to attack, but Satan could not destroy because 
one day, that child ascended to heaven to God's throne. Who, who could that be? Only Jesus Christ. Yes, that's true. Elijah went to heaven. Yes, it's true that Enoch uh, was and, and, and went to heaven. It is true. However, the Bible shares that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And so Christ was the one who Satan wanted to attack and to devour. But let's go even deeper, friends. And I want to see if you remember this. Did Satan, when Jesus was the baby, did Satan come in person as an angel and try to strangle Jesus as he was a baby? How did Satan attack uh, um, Jesus as a baby? What did he try to do? Kill him through, through whom? Through what organization? You could say Herod, but Herod was working for who? Rome, exactly, right? So Herod was working for Imperial Rome, the Roman Empire, and Herod ordered that the baby boys would be destroyed because it appears that Herod was targeting Jesus. This is very similar to in Egypt. When Moses was born, a deliverer was coming up for the people of God, and Satan knows this, perhaps, and so he uses Pharaoh to destroy the little boys. But Satan, we know, wants to destroy the male child. Satan wants to destroy Jesus. However, Satan uses a political system in order to get to Jesus. Doesn't he do that? Do you get what I'm saying? And so then, this dragon... Yes, is Satan in a primary sense. But the dragon was the Roman Empire in a secondary sense. Does that make sense? Because the dragon was Satan, but Satan was working through the Roman Empire to seek to destroy Jesus. And so here we have in the Roman Empire being operated by the devil himself to try to take Jesus but praise God, Christ was not destroyed by Satan. Christ was resurrected, even though he was crucified on a Roman cross. Even though he, uh, and we know the Jews could not crucify or, 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 or sentence anyone to death because did not have the power to that. So they had to appeal to the Roman government. And so even though he suffered a Roman crucifixion, on the third day, he rose. That makes sense? So... This is very good. So we see that this beast that is working in chapter 12, this beast is Rome. And this is the woman here that, um, and by the way, uh, the woman that Satan tried to attack was not Mary. It is the church. In the Bible, we can, I gave you some references. The Bible consistently, and this is only a few references, the Bible consistently refers to the church and compares it to a woman. The, uh, Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And so, and so um, the woman um, represents the church. And um, you may say, well, how does the woman represent the church? It doesn't make sense. Well, remember in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember that sin came into the world. And God speaks to Eve. And God says, that you will have a child, right? And that child will arise, and that child will crush Satan, the serpent's head, but he shall bruise his heel. Does that make sense? And so ever since that, that prophecy, the woman, um, um, I can imagine Eve thinking, man, am I going to have that special child? Is, she gonna be, is he going to be born to me? Is this special deliverer going to be born to me? But it wasn't born to her. In fact, the first child she has was the murderer, which is Cain. However, even in the church, the people of God, which is Israel, Israel was the Old Testament people of God, they were the church. I can imagine woman after woman reading the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and thinking, could I be the person, could I be the favored one that God would use to bring forth the special person who would reign and be resurrected and be the king of all kings? And so God came through the church. It was the church, Jesus Christ, that came to the people of the Jews. And this is why uh, this, because of prophecy, symbolically portrays the church. It was the church that had to suffer the loss of their children. Many of them lost their children. And this is likely what it means when it says the woman had birth pains in suffering. All right. So what's the point? 
the point we have to establish so far is that in chapter 12, the dragon was Satan. But even though the dragon is Satan, the dragon we saw was not interacting directly with Christ to try to destroy him as a baby. Rather, he was operating the power of Rome, the Roman Empire, to try to do that to, to Jesus. Does that make sense? That makes sense, friends. All right? So in chapter 13, this will help us to interpret it in verse 1. Look what it says. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like that of a lion. And the dragon, which we know is Satan, but who in chapter 12 was operating through the Roman Empire, this dragon that is operating through the Roman Empire, gave him, gave this beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. Now we know in chapter 13 that this beast is a religious power because it blasphemes God and it tries to do religious things, it persecutes the saints. It is a known issue in history that the Roman pontiff, the bishop of Rome, the papacy, actually inherited much of the prestige and much of the power that used to be held from the Roman emperors themselves. In fact, as the Roman Empire was disintegrating, and we saw a little bit of this yesterday, and we know the Roman Empire was never uh, conquered by any other nation. Rather, it was invaded by barbarian tribes. But as the Roman Empire was disintegrating, we know from history that the Roman uh, pontiff, which is the Bishop of Rome, the, the papacy, was able to inherit much of the power that used to belong to uh, the Roman Empire. In fact, one author says that the Roman uh, pontiff, the, 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 the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, was nothing more than the Roman Empire baptized. That's all it was. The paganism that was rampant in the Roman Empire came into the church. In fact, much of what we wrestle with, much of what we Protestants, and I'm challenging you now, much of what many Christians think is from the Bible has no foundation in Scripture, but it came in through paganism. Are we together, friends? And so it is a known issue of history that the Roman, the, the Roman um, papacy received much of the prestige that was held from the church, it, the, the Roman Empire itself. And we saw even yesterday that, um, and we, we go in here, going through some of the bullets to, to establish before we move on who the sea beast is so we can know who the, what the market beast is. Um, we saw that... Um, the second bullet part was that this power would receive a mortal wound and will let it be healed. We saw yesterday that in 17, for, for about 1,260 years, the Roman Catholic papacy was running with much power. Yes, during the, the late 1700s, during the 1700s, its power began to, to wane, but we saw that beginning at 538, with the removal of the barbarian tribe called the Ostrogoths in 538, that this cleared the way for the Roman Catholic Church to really be a, 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 a power. And we saw that there were persecutions that happened in the name of that. You can look up uh, uh, people like the Walden Seas and, and, and look at the Inquisition. And I was even uh, seeing earlier today about, I believe it was Spain and, uh, and Peru, actually, especially Peru, where you can actually see uh, 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 reenactments, at least figures, that show the kind of torture that many of the people had to suffer for opposing the church. And, and, and these things are documented in history. But we saw that in 1798, when Napoleon sent um, Berthier with the French army, and they took the Pope into uh, captivity and to exile, and the Pope died, Many people look at 1798 as being the fulfillment 
of this power receiving the mortal wound, when the Catholic papacy lost its prestige and lost its power. But in 1929, the, the papacy revived this power um, with the Vatican receiving its official status. And people look at that at least at the beginning of the healing process. The next point, we're going to just go through this very quickly. Um, it is a power with worldwide religious influence. Perhaps there's no other religious leader in the world as popular as the papacy. Friends, remember when, even when Pope John Paul died, when a Pope dies, why is it that you have presidents going, flying with Europe to sit down and mourn the death of the Pope? And not just vice president, um, and, and, and the leads of various nations uh, paying their respects to uh, a dead, more, uh, a dead uh, religious leader. It is great that they do that. However, let's be honest. If I die, do you think a president will come for me? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. So the reason why, because this points to the fact that the papacy is not something small, but has worldwide religious influence. I remember being in, uh, I think I was in Times Square early, early this year in New York City. And I remember that the Pope was coming, is that early this year or last year? It most likely it was in January, I believe. And the, the Pope was coming to, as was very popular, was coming to the States. And there was a massive billboard with him. Even when he comes, there has to be security. And he has such a large following. He was in a Time Magazine cover for uh, in, 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 uh, multiple times. And it is a well-documented fact that the papacy, the Pope, is a very popular figure in the world. All right? Um, and we saw that, skipping down to the second to the last one, it has blasphemous powers and tried to speak for God. We know from the scriptures that the Bible shows that blasphemy is one, when a person seeks to forgive sins, Remember, they accused Jesus of blasphemy because he forgave sins, but for him, it's not blasphemy because Christ is God and he can forgive sins. Amen? However, when a power seeks to uh, say that they can forgive sins, which is not God, this is blasphemy, and this is something that the priests uh, of the Catholic Church believe they have the power to do. In addition, we know that blasphemy is when a person claims to be God himself. And we know that um, in fact, let's read this quote right here from um, uh, Chan uh, Pranta Bilesir. Indeed, the excellence and power of the Roman pontiff is, the on is not only in the sphere of heavenly things, earthly things, and those of the lower regions, but even above the angels than whom he himself is greater. So this quote is saying, which is translated from a document, that the, the papacy has power that even goes to heaven and is even above the angels themselves. This is what appears the document is saying. So this is obviously blasphemous and, and, and etc. So as we look at the points, we remember from yesterday and, and from our study yesterday and our brief overview today, that it becomes very clear that this beast that arises from the sea points unquestionably to the papacy. We saw yesterday that even Arrhenius, a, a, a theologian of the church that lived only about a hundred and change, hundred so years after Christ, even he identified that the sea beast, I believe he identified, is the same person as the Antichrist. We saw that um, even um, Martin Luther, um, old reformers who even saw this, so this is nothing um, strange. I challenged you, and I hope you did it, that you went home and just did a simple search online. What did the reformers, who the reformers consider the uh, Antichrist was? And I warned you to look for yourself. And if you did, you would have seen that many of them testified that the, the papacy was either a Antichrist or the very Antichrist prophesied in Scripture. And so we saw that very clearly. And so with this being established, with this being established, and in fact, one more thing before we move on, um, because I want you to understand this very uh, thoroughly. Um, yesterday, remember, I gave you that, we spent a little time on Daniel 7.25, where 
where it says the Antichrist, which is the little horn, his activities will last for a time, a times, and a half of time. And we saw that a time likely refers to a year, and that and that it and the, the total period adds up to three and a half years. Three and a half years is equal to 30, 42 months, and the year in prophecy is 360 days. And this is also when you multiply 360 days times 3.5. It equals to 1,260 days. So this power in chapter 13 that was said to go on for 42 months goes on for the same time period as the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7, which goes on for a time, a time, and a half a time. So point by point, friends, point by point, we see, before we move on, we're going to move on, friends. Before we move on, that is very clear that the papers, that the beast power in chapter 13 lines up very well with Daniel 7. And both of them point very clearly to the papacy. Again, by no means an attack against anyone in that uh, religion. The Bible is unapologetic, is not politically correct. The Bible pronounces, the, the Bible had God had Daniel stand before King Nebuchadnezzar and pronounce to him his sins. God had the prophet Nathan stand before David and pronounce to him his sins. God had Elijah stand before Ahab and even Jezebel and pronounce to him the, the woes. So, so the Bible was not politically correct in that time. And we should not expect the scriptures to submit to popular opinion this time. Our job is to say, what saith the scriptures? And whatever it says, this is what we obey, even if it goes against our pride and our comfort. All right? And, and also, it is our job to study. Okay, fine. If we establish, if we establish that the Bible shows that there will be a of the beast, there is going to be a beast Mark points to. And if we shame that, if we identifying the beast of chapter 13 as being the papacy, if that's where identifying is, then whatever the mark will be must be therefore connected to the papacy. If the beast itself is the papacy, then whatever mark will, it is must in some way give tribute or point to the papacy itself. Therefore, this becomes not too difficult to understand. Now, before we go into what the mark of the beast is, I want us to look at what was God's mark or God's sign or God's uh, identifying mark in the Old Testament. I want us to look at a text. And the first one we're going to look at is going to be in Exodus chapter 20. It's, in a, it's on the screen. You can read it with me. And I want you to look very closely. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 14. Let's look at what God says. All right? Look what it says. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. This is God speaking to the Israelites. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. So God was serious about his law. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. For six days, uh, work may be done, but on the seventh day, there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, shall surely be put to death. So God was serious in the Old Testament. God clearly identifies that the seventh day is his day. Therefore, when somebody says, well, I keep the Lord's day. Well, if you get the Lord's day, you should be keeping the Sabbath because that's the Lord's day. Christ says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath day, even in the New Testament. All right? But let's look at verse 16 very closely. Look what it says. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It, verse 17, and I underlined this and made it bold, it is a sign 
the Sabbath. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. So the church say amen. So God clearly says, I want you to keep all my laws. All of them are crucial. None of them can be dispensed with. However, the Sabbath of all the commandments has an additional significance in that the Sabbath becomes a sign. All the commandments are important. We keep all the laws. But the Sabbath, friends, God says, not me, is a sign. You say, okay, Richard, that's nice. But just one place in the Bible. That's nice. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. And we're going to be reading um, verses uh, 12 and 20. Ezekiel chapter 20 is in the Old Testament. One of the major prophets. Ezekiel chapter 20. Let's look at what God reiterates in the Bible. Ezekiel 20. We're going to begin at verse 12. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And so the Bible says that a Sabbath is a sign that I'm the one that's sanctifying them. Let's go down to verse 20. Sanctify my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Ah, this is interesting. And so even in the Old Testament, God's people had a signifying mark. Yes, circumcision was also a sign. However, the Sabbath is the sign that is also a commandment. And so this is a perpetual sign that goes on forever, that God's saying that this marks that I am the one that is sanctifying you. Now, knowing this in our brains, knowing that God's people had the sign of the Sabbath, even in the Old Testament, and God himself chose to be the symbol, the outward visible mark, not a literal mark, friends, but the outward vis visible indicator that these are my people. This is a sign. Out of all the sons that could have chosen, that's a commandment. This is the only commandment of the ten that's also a sign. And what is it? My Sabbaths. Now notice, and we're going to close, so we don't have to read this long. In chapter 14 again. Let's go, go back there. Notice in chapter 14, we saw what the, the third angel said. They said, don't get the mark of the beast. But notice chapter 14. Look at what the first angel says. Look what it says. It says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. And we saw in Exodus chapter 20, that and in verse 8, God says, remember the seventh day. And then I believe verse 11 says, because uh, for God created the, the earth and the heavens and the, and the sea springs of water. So in the first angel, in chapter 14, watch this closely, because we get to the main point. The first angel in chapter 14 is calling the world not just to worship God, but even in the very language, worship the creator God. But the very language takes us back to the seventh commandment. So it seems that the angel who is crying out and saying, worship God, make him, your, make him your true God and worship him. As he's doing that, the angel is calling people back to worship the creator. And one obvious way to worship the creator is worship the Sabbath that points to the creator. Now, if the first angel in chapter 14, is calling people to worship God, worship the Creator, and that very message is reminiscent and points back to, the, to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, 
which caused people to worship God on the Sabbath and keep that day holy. If God is the first angel in his message points to the Sabbath, but in chapter, in verse, uh, if we go down to verse uh, uh, 9 to 11, in the third angel's message, where God said, the angel said, listen, do not take the mark of the beast. And if you mark, if you take, mark, get the mark of the beast and you worship the dragon, I worship the beast, then you'll get the wine of God's wrath poured out um, with that mixture. If worship was God's issue in the first message, and that worship was pointing to the worship of the Creator and pointing to the Sabbath commandment, then it would probably seem that if God is saying not to worship the beast, then perhaps in some way, shape, or form, the way the beast is wanting worship in, in, in the last days must mean it must be in some way that contradicts the worship of God at, in, of the Sabbath day and the worshiping as a creator. It must be that way. But let's study more to, to get even more clues. Now remember that the Sabbath was the sign and that was God's visible mark upon his people that this was uh, my people. And we saw, even in documents, that sadly, the Roman papacy has claimed that it was their prerogative, the church's prerogative, to be able to, char to change the Sabbath commandment from Saturday to Sunday. And we saw that for them, this shows their authority. And anyone, and we saw even, um, on, I believe, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, John Eck even challenged Luther and said, listen, how can you claim, I'm paraphrasing, how can you claim to be Protestant and be solely by the scriptures, yet you still keep the Sunday, which originated with us, the church? And so we see that the church has in their mind that Sunday really is a mark of their authority. So if Saturday, Friday night, the Sabbath, Saturday night, was God's designated mark, one of God's designated mark that was also a commandment in the Old Testament, pointing to him, it would seem that the beast who we already identified as the papacy, Roman Catholic papacy, who we already saw felt that they had the prerogative to change God's Sabbath day, uh, on, which is on Saturday, to make it onto Sunday and use the excuse of the resurrection. If we saw, they can do that. And we saw that in, in chapter 13, uh, chapter, uh, Daniel 7, that the beast power would even try to change times and laws. And we saw that the law of God, the fourth command, was trying to change by the, 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 the papacy. Then, friends, it begins to become increasingly clear that perhaps the mark of the beast is not merely any weird thing that points to the papacy, but it must be something that in obedience to the papacy causes us to disobey God. If the Old Testament, the Sabbath was a sign, and if Satan has a counterfeit, then it must mean that perhaps Sunday becomes the sign of the papacy, the worship of God, and keeping Sunday as a Sabbath becomes the papacy's own mark, its own sign, its own badge of allegiance. When it comes people to worship it, and people knowingly worship it as opposed to worshiping God on the Sabbath. Could it be, friends? I want to challenge you. Could it be that there perhaps can come a day when the laws of the government, because the Bible says the beast, uh, the earth beast, which we don't know who that is yet because we didn't study that yet, the earth beast will cause people, so there's an element of force there, to worship the beast, to worship the beast. And we know that beast to be the papacy, 
Could it be that there could come a day where we are forced, we are, we are faced with decision to have to choose whether I'm going to worship God and keep the seventh day holy, which is a sign to God and, and God's identified mark of his people, or will I, in defiance against God, choose to stubbornly hold to the Sunday who we already know not only contradicts the law of God, not only contradicts the first angel's message that caused people to worship the creator, but also points to the authority of the papal church. Friends, as a preacher today, I have no doubt in my mind that the mark of the beast, the mark that points to his authority in contradiction, in contradistinction to God's mark, I have no doubt, as I stand with you today, that this mark of the beast is nothing else but the false papal Sabbath, which is on Sunday. I have no doubt. I have no doubt that one day, somehow, some way, that Satan will use a beast who we have not identified yet to coerce and to force people into worshiping and keeping Sunday holy, even though God clearly shows that there is no foundational command to, to have Sunday as God's holy day. I have no doubt. There's no question in my mind that this mark of the beast, this mark that points to the beast's authority rather than the authority of the only creator God is the counterfeit mark, the counterfeit sign, the counterfeit Sabbath. And I believe there will come a day, as it says in Revelation chapter 13, where a beast will coerce and seek to force people into worshiping God and paying homage and disregarding the Sabbath and keeping a day that God never said to worship. Keep holy. Let's get it clear. I'm a Christian, and I believe that I should worship God every day. God owns the whole week. But God sanctified a particular day. God made a particular day holy. God was creating the world. And for some reason, it was on the seventh day that he himself felt that he had to rest. If God, the almighty God, if he felt that he had to start working after creation, who am I as a mere human being to say, it doesn't matter which day. Who am I as a human being to keep a Sunday that has no foundation in the scriptures? Who am I as a human being to say that it doesn't matter? Who am I as a human being to even walk away from even one of the least of God's commandments? Who am I? To look at the law and to see the longest law of the ten. The one that as God was describing with his own fingers, spent the most time on. The most words. Who am I to look at that in the middle of, in the middle of the law and say, it doesn't matter. Woe is me, friends. Woe is me. If I see the word and turn away. And keep a day holy that points to no higher authority than a church. Jesus says, you are the servant whom you obey. The question of which Sabbath you choose it's really a question to whom, whom, what master you will choose.
Each Sabbath has a different origin. One points all the way back to the Creator, but one points to a proud beast, a proud organization that thought that it can even change the times, the laws. And before we close, I want to tell you guys to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're about done. This is not complicated. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. I want to show you something very interesting. Deuteronomy 6. If you look at the Bible, to do a clear, easy Google search, you will know that where is the first place where God um, lists his Ten Commandments? You tell me, where? In the Bible, where's the first place that God lists his Ten Commandments? Where is it? Exodus 20. Where is this? Deuteronomy 5. That's right. And so in Deuteronomy 5, you have a reiteration of the commandments. But after the commandments, look what it says in Deuteronomy 6. And I want you to look at this when we get home. Deuteronomy 6. I want us to go down to verse 4. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Look what it says. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Verse 8. Watch this, friends. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Did you see that, friends? And so even in the Old Testament, God's instructions, God's words, he wanted to be symbolically ascribed on the forehead and on the hands. Researchers believe that the forehead represents the thoughts. In your mind, God wants you to worship him. But many believe that the hand represents the works. God wants you not just to say he's right, but God wants you to live it out in obedience. And so we see in the Old Testament that God wanted his instructions. He wanted people. He says, love the Lord your God with your heart. And then he says, to, to bind these words as a sign, after he gives the commandment, after he says, love your God with all your heart, he says to bind his instructions on your right hand, on your forehead. Isn't it interesting that if God calls people to symbolically ascribe his laws on their foreheads, on their hands, isn't it interesting that in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 13, that this beast power was trying to get people to worship it and want to give them a sign or a mark on their right hand, on their forehead. It's a shame that this beast power is seeking to counterfeit what God himself did in the Old Testament. And so I'm convinced that the mark of the beast is no barcode, is not a very chip or any microchip, is not a barcode or even a credit card. I believe that the mark is a symbolic reference to the, to the mark and a, 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 a token of allegiance that people give to the papacy even when they know that God's true sign was the Sabbath day. Before we leave, I want to make one thing clear. I never said that a person who keeps Sunday as a Sabbath has the mark of the beast. Never said that. The Bible shows that there will come a day when this Sunday is enforced. Is anybody forcing you to go to church on Sunday today? Nobody's forcing you to go to church on Sunday. Is anybody forbidding you to come to church on Saturday? No one's forbidding you. However, 
there will come a day, and for the rest of your life, I will ask you to remember what I'm saying. There will come a day where you will notice that there will be religious intolerance that will rise up. And friends, I'm already seeing religious intolerance, at least in my country, the United States. I already, I'm already seeing that even some religions, even the Muslims, are, are being targeted. Um, and religion, for some religions are, are targeted and this religion tolerance. And I believe that the climate in that country and even others will get worse and worse. That, they will, that the freedoms of people will become more and more restricted. And I want you to keep your eyes open. You look, and when you see that they say, why not we enforce Sunday? Why not we, we lay aside Sunday as an official day of rest? <laughs> when you see that, let the watcher of the news beware. And remember that this day, it was proclaimed to you ahead of time. But do not wait for that to happen. Do not wait to see if I'm right. You know what God says. You know he points unquestionably to the Sabbath. Don't wait for a threat to come in the future. Know what God said today. Know that God says, I want you to keep the Sabbath, but not only the Sabbath, all of the laws. But since the Sabbath has been forgotten, I want you to keep that one especially. Develop a character starting today that says, I will obey God above everything else. Even after losing a job, I'm going to obey God. Even if I have to be kicked out of my family, I'm going to obey God. Even if I'm going to lose friends, I'm going to obey God. I might lose my popularity. But I'd rather stand with God because until you can develop that kind of backbone, it will be very hard to imagine, if not possible, that if this law is actually enforced one day, and I believe it will be, it will be very hard to believe that you will be able to stand. If you couldn't be faithful to God where things were peaceful, how can you stand when things become terrible? If there's no threat, or the threats are relatively not life-threatening, and you still cannot obey God, what makes you think that when you're forced to choose between a Sabbath, the, 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 the counterfeit Sabbath, and death, that you'll be able to stand? If you want to stand on that day, you must learn what it means to stand now. That backbone must be developed now. The jellyfish backbone must be given away. And you must learn what it means to stand for God now. Because if you don't stand for God now, friends, it would be hard to believe. In fact, it might even be impossible that when the things get difficult, that you'll be able to stand for God then. I want you to contemplate these things as the appeal song is sung. And I want you to pray to God and ask God for help to be faithful even if the heavens fall.